Good morning. This is an unofficial good morning. You'll get a more official one in a moment. Oh, I'm so excited. This is great to be together. Today is a very special day. It's Christmas Eve. We're going to celebrate today the advent of Jesus Christ. The best thing. The very best thing. Um, we will be, I appreciate you all accommodating us and sitting in the middle section. We wanted to make sure everyone was able to see well to the, uh, the kids program that they put a lot of work into. Um, they look awesome. They're going to come out here directly whenever the, the play begins. Um, I would ask if you are able to stay around for a few minutes after the service, we want to set up for the Christmas Eve uh, candlelight service. And as you can see, the set is very, uh, it's involved. And so uh, we could uh, use some help with that. So if you're able to stick around for a few minutes afterward, we want to invite you to do that. It's good to be together today. I want to get out of the way so that we can start. Sue? I can see you all. Can you all see me? <laughs> For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. What an incredible gift. What a privilege it is for us to be able to come into this holy place this morning to celebrate his birth, the birth of God's greatest gift, and to worship him. We'd like to welcome each of you if you are new faces to our congregation, or whether you're familiar faces, we just pray that each of you will be blessed by our time together this morning. It is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and on this day we celebrate love. To paraphrase the great philosopher Snoopy, when you choose love, you feel good, and when you feel good, you do good. And when you do good, it reminds others of what love feels like. And it just might inspire them to do the same. Christmas is the perfect time to celebrate the love of God and family and to create memories that will last forever. Jesus is God's perfect and indescribable gift. It is a true blessing that not only are we able to receive this gift, but we'll, we are able to share it with others on Christmas and every other day of the year. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Will you join me in prayer? God of love, we come before you with grateful hearts. We are in awe of your perfect gift, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we're, we're grateful for the infinite love that you have for us. Be with us as we worship you today, O oh Lord. May our thoughts, our words, our hearts honor and glorify you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Make sure I have that right. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world 
that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he has loved us and, his, and has sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's now time for us to light the candle of love our fourth Advent candle. Do you want to wait? Oh, go ahead. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. That's Psalm 89, 1 through 4. And if you'll join me in the responsive reading. New life is coming. We can count it in days now. God is breaking through. God's word will change the world. We will all be changed by the language of love. The covenant has come down through generations. The love of God is never ending. We give thanks for the faithfulness. Today we light the candle of love and thank you for lighting that. And join me in this final response. We give thanks for God's steadfast love. Over 2,000 years ago, in a city called Nazareth, there was a young woman who was called Mary. Mary was promised to marry a man named Joseph who lived there too. One day, an angel from God came and talked to Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now Joseph wasn't sure what to do when he heard that Mary was going to have a baby. One night, while he was asleep, the angel came to talk to Joseph, too. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife. A while later, the emperor in Rome, Caesar Augustus, said that everyone had to go to their own hometown to be counted. So Mary and Joseph went to Joseph's hometown of Bethlehem. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Please join us in singing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. other people in Bethlehem too. There were so many people in fact that there was no room for them in the inn, so they stayed in a stable, which is a place where the animals stayed warm and dry. While they were there, baby Jesus was born, and Mary took him and wrapped him up and laid him in the manger. some shepherds out in the fields watching over their flocks of sheep. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, when lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. 
You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, Praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven the shepherds said to one another let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass with the Lord which the Lord hath made known unto us and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger and when they had seen it they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child and all they had all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Jesus had been born, wise men came to Jerusalem from the east, looking for the newly born King of the Jews. <laughs> they asked King Herod where this baby was. Where is he? Who was born the king of the Jews? So the king asked his advisors, Where is this king of the Jews to be born? In Bethlehem. In Bethlehem? Go and find him and let me know where he is so I can come and worship him too. So the wise men went and found the baby Jesus by following his star. And when they found him, they worshipped him.
But King Herod didn't really want to worship baby Jesus. He wanted to harm him. The wise men were warned by God about this, so they went home another way. When King Herod found out he had been tricked, he was really mad. He was determined to destroy this newborn king, so King Herod sent soldiers to Bethlehem to find the baby Jesus. But God warned Joseph in a dream to leave, and so they did. Joseph, Mary, and the little baby Jesus went to Egypt. They stayed there until the evil King Herod died. After King Herod died, God told Joseph it was safe to come back. So Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus came back from Egypt to the little town of Nazareth. Glory to God in the highest, peace, peace on, on earth, earth. good will, will to men. To men. as Pastor John just said, and I have to follow that. <laughs> we have indeed been blessed. And it is now the time of our service when we come together to give our gifts. As we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings this Christmas Eve morning, let's be reminded that every gift which is given even though it may be small, is in reality great if it is given with love. Christmas is most truly Christmas when we celebrate it by giving the light of God's love to others. May we give in the spirit of love. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we are so blessed by all that we have been given. We're especially blessed, Lord, by the children. Thank you for them. Thank you for their willingness to be part of your story today, Lord. And thank you for those teachers and helpers who have helped put this together. Just now, Lord, we thank you for these gifts. We ask that they might be used to further your kingdom here on earth and honor and glorify you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So they asked me whether I wanted to be in the Judean countryside or in the stable or in the palace. And I think I need to be, not for my sake, but for the sake of the story, I need to be in the palace. So I'm going to move over here. The reading today comes from Matthew's Gospel, and you've already heard it. And so I feel like uh, I'm... Now, that's a hard act to follow, Sue. Those kids did such a wonderful job, and I'm so grateful. But the story from Matthew, I want to just highlight a few verses from chapter 2, verse 9. This is after the wise men had come and, and, and were sent out. When they had heard the king where to find the baby, the, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it had stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. You know, when you're a citizen of a superpower... It's easy to lose sight of the things that are beyond your own borders. When we think about the life of Jesus, it's hard to think about any empire or kingdom other than Rome. We had a representative of that here on the stage a bit ago. Because that's pretty much where all the action takes place in Jesus' life and the early church. Now, to be fair, Rome itself was, was really diverse. It, it spread out all over the place. It's hard to get your head around all the little countries and, and kingdoms and so forth that it, they had conquered and, 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 and ran. We might be forgiven if, if we don't give much thought to what was going on beyond the borders of the empire. But obviously, there were people, people outside the boundaries of Rome. To the east of modern Turkey, the the Parthian Empire was there. It covered a massive chunk of Central Asia. Uh, The Han Dynasty in China, there were lots of people there at this time, Uh, at least an area as large as the one controlled by Rome. The, The empires in India, the Arabian Peninsula, they were occupied by tribes and kingdoms and allied groups. Over in the Euphrates Valley, the remnants of the Assyrians and the Babylonians were still there, wandering that land east of Rome. This was no wasteland that we're talking about outside the empire. While Rome was certainly a major player, they were not the only player, not by a long shot. Now, Judea, uh, while it was the focal point of our story, it wasn't much more than a border territory for the Romans. There was a great deal of commerce that went through there, exchange that flowed through the region and and it provided a stable uh, beachhead on the western Mediterranean but it really wasn't that high of a priority for Rome. They were content to set up a a puppet ruler, uh, uh, somebody there that would keep the population under control and, and who would protect their flank from whoever might come in from the outside, from the deserts to the southeast, the grasslands to the north. More often than not, Rome's attention was somewhere else. It's Judea's place as a border territory that factors into the story today. The protagonists of our story, they're border jumpers. They're foreigners. 
They're coming into this place that is not their own. They're aliens. When everybody else was focused to the west, where Rome was, these travelers sneak in the back door and testify to events that ripple out into eternity. You know who we're talking about. You saw them come in earlier. There's not many biblical figures that have so much layered on top of them, so much tradition placed on them. Now, Matthew is, is the only gospel that tells us anything about them, these visitors from the east, and Matthew only does it in a few verses in that second chapter. So the details are a little sketchy. We only know a few things for sure. Matthew calls them magi, uh, probably what we would refer to as seers or, or mystics or astrologers. He says that they came from the east, and since Judea was right there on the western edge of the empire, that means that they were not part of the Roman structure. They came from outside, and, and finally Matthew tells us that they came to worship, to pay homage They'd seen what they considered a, a powerful sign in the night sky, a star that was shining, and they followed up on what they believed to be a very important message. So just these few details, but so much has been built on them, so much has been made of them. We call them kings. We sing that song probably because of their ability to enter into and walk in the halls of power when they came to Jerusalem. Maybe because of the value of their gifts that they brought with them. The, we think of that there were three of them. The, again, probably connected to the gifts this time, the number of gifts. Tradition has even named them. Caspar, Melchior, Balthazar. We put them on camels and, and we, we put crowns on their heads. We dress them in fine robes. And they have a, a big part to play at this time of year. There's a, even a festival on the church calendar, the, the Feast of Epiphany on January 6th, is at least in part meant to celebrate the adoration of the Magi. These visitors, they cast a long shadow in the life and the history of the church, which is interesting because there is really so little, such a limited mention of them in the, in the Bible. So we sing the songs, we three kings of Orient are, but they weren't really kings. It's more likely that they were ambassadors, emissaries, if they were connected to royalty at all. But just because these visitors weren't really kings, it doesn't mean that this story isn't about kings. There are still kings in the story, but they're not coming from the east. It's really more of a story about the kings and the kingdoms that these magi, these wise men, find when they come west. So instead of three kings, there are two. And the interaction that the magi have with the kings that they find, it shines a light on our response to the kings that we find, that we encounter. See, the recipient of their adoration still deserves ours. The first king that the Magi encounter is the king of this world. Now, the picture that we may have, the one that we were perhaps hinted at here in the, in the story that the kids did, is that the Magi walk into Herod's palace looking for this newborn king. But the text really only says that they came to Jerusalem. Obviously, though, Herod's going to hear about it. It's not a secret. It says so. And it says that Herod was troubled along with Jerusalem with him. Now, since Herod, or Matthew has introduced Herod, we need to look at him a little bit. Tradition tells us that this Herod, the one that sat in this chair, was Herod the Great. There are more than one Herods, and uh, there's several in the Gospel accounts. But here, Herod the Great, he was a prominent figure in history. We know about him in other sources. He was a puppet ruler, that, that client king that we mentioned earlier, the one that Rome had placed on the throne so they could kind of keep control of Judea. And Herod was a brutal and brilliant politician, not like Gilbert. Gilbert's a good guy, so that's just an actor there. But Herod himself, he managed to make the best of the situation that he was in as far as he could, this tricky uh, situation. Herod had converted to Judaism. The, the religion of the Jewish people. He was not a Jew by birth. 
He was an Idumean, an Edomite from south of Judah. Now this fact would not have been lost on the Jews that uh, he was trying to control. Jerusalem had a long memory. They would not have failed to note this, that Herod was descended from Esau. You know, that other brother, the one who had lost his birthright and his blessing. So beyond his collusion with Rome, his cooperation with the Roman, the hated Roman authorities, there would have been this sense of illegitimacy hanging over his reign. And that constant suspicion from the people, his subjects, it would have been a heavy burden on Herod. He probably, should have thought, probably thought that they should have paid him a little bit more respect. And Jewish tradition recalls he had a violent paranoia about losing his throne, particularly near the end of his life. Now, because of the prominent place of kings in this story, we, we need to kind of look a little bit at the politics of the situation, too, because Jesus comes into the world, and it's not somehow apolitical, as if this stuff doesn't happen, as if the world exists only on some spiritual level. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of power plays, a lot of influence peddling then, just like there is today. And it's why this line in the text is so important, that all Jerusalem was troubled along with Herod when these visitors come, they show up from the east. Imagine the impact their words would have had, the bombshell of that announcement. Hey, you know, we've seen this star which we believe means that a new king has been born for the Jews. And we've come to worship him, to pay homage to him. So uh, where is he? Now think about how that's going to affect the people that are in charge, who have no idea what they're talking about. Jealous, insecure, violent, Herod, he catches wind of this. Maybe, like tradition says, they come right into his palace and try to find this newborn king. This pronouncement, this word from the Magi, it's disturbing, it's unsettling, it's troubling. The, the house of cards that Herod and the, the Jerusalem elite have so carefully built, it's, it's perched on a really flimsy table. And these foreigners have come in like a bull in a china cupboard, ready to knock it all down, shouting, where is this newborn king of the Jews? Now, it's just natural, really. It's what a king seeker would do. They would go to the palace, look in the, the halls of power and prestige. It makes sense that these magi would come to Jerusalem, the capital of the Jews, to find the king of the Jews. They don't know what effect their words have, the powder keg that their actions are about to set off. They're just doing what they know to do, what they best know to do. But but even though they don't understand it yet, they're not looking for an ordinary king. You see, the king that they're seeking, it doesn't, this king doesn't fit any of the patterns that we've gotten used to when we think of kings. These wise men of Jerusalem, the, the, the king's advisors, they, Herod's advisors, they send these foreigners off to Bethlehem. That's where you need to go. The prophet says that the long-sought king would be born there. So now we can begin to consider this other king, the second king in our story, the first in truth. Not born in a palace, but born in a stable. Not a powerful warrior, but a helpless baby. Not born to play politics, but to transcend the political with a new ethic, an ethic of love and forgiveness and servanthood. I think the contrast between these two kings couldn't be more stark. The king of the world, well, the king of the world is in constant conflict with the king of heaven. While the king of the world sits in a palace on a throne, he still struggles with legitimacy. And in terms of the worldly legitimacy, the king of heaven, well, the king of heaven is born to an unwed mother in a meager stable, a manger took the place of a throne. We didn't have a manger, so we had to use a, a small cradle. Yet all authority on heaven and on earth is given to him. Now the kings of the world, they grasp at power. The king of heaven comes as a baby, the absolute least powerful human creature that you could imagine. 
The king of the world forces others to serve him. The king of heaven, who being in all respects God, did not think equality with God was something to be held on to, but released it to take on our form, even the form of a servant being obedient to death. Some beautiful words from Paul's letter to Philippians. So we have two kings, two kingdoms, two approaches to life, two opportunities to worship. So which one do we choose? Now Matthew tells a wonderful story here. We only, we only had part of it in the text that I read. We had much more with the kids as what they, what they shared with us. But there's a good reason that Matthew only includes a little bit of the details of these visitors. You see, we're not supposed to know the whole story about them. We're not supposed to know everything about them because they're not really the focus of the story. This is a story about kings, but it's not kings from the east. It's a story of the king of the world and the king of heaven. And we're supposed to identify with these visitors, these magi that come in. We join them on their journey from a distant land. Like they were pulled, compelled to see the king, we are compelled to come and find this king. And and just like the wise men, we don't always go to the right place. We don't always act with, with wisdom. We seek the king of heaven in the halls and the palaces of the world still. We think that a king has to inhabit earthly capitals. We come as aliens, as strangers, as foreigners, seeking to be illuminated, seeking revelation, but it's not always easy for us to see that star that guides us to the king of heaven. There's too many other distractions. We get sidetracked by the world. We step into danger and intrigue. We may not even know that we're in danger. So who do we choose to worship? Who is the object of our adoration? In this story that Matthew shares with us, there are these wise men, and they come into the orbit of kings. They've come to worship, but they need to choose which king to adore, which one that they're going to lay their gifts in front of. Now, it's significant that they would be thought of as pagans. They come from the worship of false gods to find the true God. The king they seek is the true king of heaven. It's significant that they are foreigners, that those on the outside, aliens, they're the ones who are among the first to bow in reverence, while the ones who should be leading this procession of worship, they are blind to the advent of the king. And we can find hope there and inspiration there in all those finer points of the story. But this story, it's not really a story of magi. It's a story of kings. The worship of the king of heaven, it's a radical act. From the perspective of this world, it's disruptive, it's troubling It spreads fear in the palaces and the capitals of the world. Now, in many ways, it would be far easier for us to just fall into line with with the kings of the world, to, to bow down to whatever prince or potentate or president who promises us peace and security, who promises us what we want. The kings of this world do that. They make grand promises, but they all come at a great price. The kings of this world hunger for our worship, our devotion, our adoration. They scream for attention all the time. But the kings of this world, they rule over self-serving kingdoms. They tap into our own selfish nature to protect their position and their prestige and their privilege. You heard it. Herod, he didn't want to join the magi in adoration of the child. No, no. He wanted to destroy him because the king of heaven will overcome all of the kingdoms 
and empires of this world. Now when the Magi finally do find Christ, when they bow and they present their precious things to him that they brought, they, they're making a pretty profound statement. This little child, in a, in a humble house, in a nondescript backwater town, in what to them was a foreign empire, this child is worthy of worship. And their, their adoration, the very fact that they come to worship in the first place sends shockwaves out into that society. That devotion that they exhibit, it strikes a line, a boundary line in the world, the border between the empires of the world and the kingdom of heaven. Love, adoration, worship. These are a loyalty oath. They're like a pledge of allegiance. They, they are powerful statements of our faithfulness to our king. And so do we, like the Magi, offer that devotion to the king of heaven? Or are we misled by the kings of this world? Love for Christ, for the king of heaven, the true king of heaven, draws us into a kingdom that is unlike any that we have ever known or ever seen, the kingdom where the first are actually the last and the last are first, the kingdom where those who would be the greatest must become the servant of all, where instead of becoming mighty, we must become like a child before we can enter it and see it. Of all of these empires of the world, that is the only kingdom the only one worthy of our king, the only one worth being part of. And it really is a wise man, a wise person who through love seeks it and finds it and enters in. Pray with me. Lord God, we have been reminded powerfully in what the children have shared with us and from these words from your scripture how important it is for us to find a source for us to worship. Uh, 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 how important it is for us to come to you and to be devoted to you above all else. We see in the example of these wise men an adoration, and homage that you deserve. They came from such a long ways through so many trials at such great risk to be devoted to you. They weren't distracted. They didn't turn aside. And they were rewarded. Lord, I pray that each one of us would seek them, seek, seek you like they did. Lord, in this time of year, in this special celebration, may we come and worship you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You want me to move it back over here? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, you're fine. I'm probably <laughs> you're good.
if you would bow with me. Yes, I want to clap for that too. <laughs> Lord, we are grateful that you've gathered us together on this very special day. And we know that it is a time of celebration and festivities. So we pray a blessing on each one of those gatherings that will happen today and tomorrow. Oh, we are grateful. We are so blessed to be your children. We pray for those that can't be with us today. We do uh, surround them with your blessing too in this special time. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. We are overwhelmed by your love. Be with us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Invite you all to come if you are able this evening to our candlelight service. Otherwise, you may go in God's love.